with Pavel Mikhailovich, who is an economist. He's a blogger for the club, for the club, for, for the club on my mind, right? He writes for many um, Serbian journals as a uh, correspondent and an editor of some, right? And of course, some of us think that if we need a Minister of Economy, that should be Pavel. <laughs> so, please, Pavel Mikhailovich. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Am I loud enough? Is it, is it okay? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Pavel Mihailovic, as you heard. Uh, I'm blog author at Club von Neumann, if you want to say it properly. <laughs> and uh, also, I'm a master's student in Faculty of Economics uh, here in Belgrade. Here, I am as a person who is uh, in many ways affiliated with the Libertarian Club. And I want to congratulate them for a really, really good organized, perfectly organized conference. And it is a great privilege and honor to speak here today, um, especially about this topic that I find very, very interesting and important and that I wrote about a lot. So this is um, also some kind of uh, gratitude for, for my friends for everything we've done together. Right now, I want to come to the topic of my today's lecture. Uh, the topic is um, about economics, especially about economics of uh, public pension system. So the title is Unsustainable Pension because we talk about sustainability of public pension systems. And in the lecture we'll see there is none. And also I will talk about morality of public pension system. It's basically a story of economics and morality of public pension system. But uh, when I talk about morality, I will talk about some important features that you might not previously have thought of that might help you in any discussion that is related to ideology. So this is not a libertarian lecture. It's not even free market lecture. It's economics lecture. And that's what I want to make it uh, in, in front. And that's what I want you to think about. What I do here, you can find in the paper that I wrote for this conference also. It will be uh, published in three hours on my blog. And you can find it there. You can download it freely. Uh, it's with the same title. And all the things I do here, if you leave here and you don't have uh, time to ask me a question, you can find, find there in great detail. If you need more, always contact me. OK, so let's, let's start with the lecture. The goals of this lecture, are there, there are four parts of the lecture. The first one is to show that public pension systems are unsustainable. And I will show you why, in which economic way, and what are the consequences of unsustainability of public pension system. Also, we will illustrate this uh, unsustainability through the example of Serbia. Um, there are three reasons why we do this. First one, many of you are from Serbia, so it should be interesting for you and your future. Uh, the second reason is that Serbia is a really, really good uh, illustration of the situation in which every single pension system will be in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And third, the level of unsustainability in Serbia is so high, so huge, that it really, really good depicts the economic problem of public pension system. Then afterwards, uh, we will talk about those morality issues from the economic uh, point of view, some economic arguments that you can use in future. And also at the end, we will talk about uh, privatization, possible privatization and the important features of possible reform of public pension system, what you should consider and think about when you think about it. Okay, so first, public pension system. The story of public, of public pension system is really important because public pension system is the biggest part of the welfare state program. It's the biggest government program in majority of countries, in Serbia especially. Uh, around 11 to 12 percent of GDP goes to pensions. So it's a huge program. Also since it's uh, financially unsustainable, and we will see especially in Serbia, you will see that it is also a, a great financial burden for today uh, governments, for public finance, and therefore it's the biggest financial program within the state. Uh, it is most expensive and most challenging because the future of it is uh, not uncertain. It's pretty much certain that the deficit will increase and the problem will increase in the near future. 
It also makes huge deficits within it, so they are covered through general budget and therefore there is a huge deficit of general budget. In majority of countries and in Serbia, until this year, in Serbia and in other countries uh, even now, the deficit of public pension system is greater than the deficit of the general public budget. So deficit of public pension system in Serbia is 6% of GDP. And that's really, really, really huge number. And has to be calculated when you think about the problems of indebtedness of Serbia and the problems of future growth of public debt. The main driver of that debt is public pension system. How does public pension system work? Well, almost all public pension systems are organized on the basis of pay-as-you-go system. It's uh, pay-as-you-go because it's currently financed. You pay your pensions, your benefits to the retirees through the current contributions of people who are working and contributing a small increment of their money. It's not that small, but that's the basic idea. Um, secondly, uh, today's contributions um, should cover current expenses in public pension system based on a pay-as-you-go. So you basically take the money from workers today, you pay pensioners today, and also to have a, a long-term sustainability of public pension system, you should also have some excess funds to put it aside on savings and then invest it, and from those invest in, investment in the future, gain benefits and profits, and to finance increasing benefits in the future. That's the basic principle of pay-as-you-go system in theory. How should we work in theory? It's not how it works in real world, but we will see that later. So basic idea is that you have a number of workers and you have pensioners. And all those workers contribute a small increment of their income. Let's say you have 100 euros a month and you give 10, 10 euros a month for pension system. Those, pensions are, those contributions are gathered in public pension fund and dispersed to pensioners as a monthly allowances of pensions. Idea is small increments of money give a, uh, uh, give a big substitution for previous earnings for pensioners. So the basic idea is that you go to pension, you do not earn any more your wage, but you have sust substantial substitution for your previous earnings the level of debt substitution is called substitution rate, will be important later to explain it. But the point is that with small increments of contribution of people, you get substantial substitution of your earnings. But how does it really work? Something like this. That's the basic principle how today's and tomorrow's pension system function. So you have a really, really small amount of workers who have to contribute really, really much to get almost modest pensions in today's system. Illustration of Serbian example, we show how small are today's pensions and how huge are contributions and expenses for that system. And the basic reason why it is like that is because it's currently financed. You have noticed that I've, I've erased the number of workers here in the picture. And that's why, because today, number of workers is uh, decreasing relative to the number of pensioners. So the basic idea of pay as go system doesn't function anymore because contributions that go to public pension fund are dispersed in the pensions. But the problem is, and this uh, should be green, but it's a different color area, actually shows the amount of money that is paid out as a benefit to pensioners, but it's not covered through contributions. So pensions today are bigger than contributions into the system. Interesting question now, where does this money come from? Well, it comes from government, who subsidizes or covers the deficit of public pension system, or public pension funds, finances the excess uh, spending on pensions uh, in excess of contributions, but those deficits that are covered are covered through taxes. And the basic reason why I made this illustration this way is because the same people who finance system through contributions finance the system through taxes. These are the same people. And that's the most important point about public pension system. 
even though if it's in deficit, it doesn't mean that it doesn't create costs. The real costs are equal to the number of benefits paid out and has to be covered. And it's covered either for contributions or for taxes. And we will explain later the concept of implicit costs and measure of implicit costs to show how huge, especially in Serbia, these excess costs that go for taxes are. So what is the basic principle of Pesigo system? I know majority of you doesn't like math. And I myself do not like math in economics that much, but it's sometimes really, really useful to show the basic idea. This is the equation that should show the principal conditions of balanced pension systems. So basically, if you want your system to be balanced, to have no deficits, this equation has to be fulfilled. Now, seems maybe complicated, but the, the letters here are not representing the simplicity of the idea that well, so I will explain it right now. NW, number of workers, their average wage, their contribution rate. Contribution rate here shows the level of payroll tax that is going to pension system. So basically in Serbia, if you work and you pay legally payroll tax, payroll tax is around 40 some percent of your salary, but from those 40 some percent, 22 percent goes to pension. So when I say contribution rate, I'm talking about contribution rate of payroll tax that goes to public pension system. And that has to be equal to number of retirees and their average pension. Why is that so? Well, the idea is that if you want to have sustainable either in, in one moment balanced pension system, financially balanced pension system, you should have equality of funds that you spend for pensions and funds that you gather through contributions. So basically on the right side, we have average pension. And when you multiply average pension with number of pensioners, you get the total expansion fund for the pensions, expenses fund. So you spend this much. In Serbia, monthly, it's 338 million euros. Monthly needed to pay the average pension of pensioners in Serbia. So that's the amount of money you monthly have to have if you finance the system. So if you want to have balanced, financially balanced system to have no deficits, your money gathered has to equal your money spent. And what is your money gathered? Well, you have average taxable wage average taxable salary, and you have contribution rate. These two give you average contribution. Then you multiply the average contribution with number of workers, and you get the total contribution fund. So basically the principal equation, which seems a little bit rough, in its nutshell is that contribution funds have to be equal to funds of costs of pension system. That is basic principle idea about all this thing. I made this equation because for this equation later, when we account a real numbers, we can show what should be required ratio of workers to pensioners for balance system, what should be average pension if you don't want you if you don't want to have deficits, or if you want to continue paying the same pensions, what is the real cost of pension system? Just one simple equation shows it. So let's take up an example. Substitution rate, as I previously said, is when you take in the relation average pension, average wage. Substitution rate of 50% would actually mean that if you have 100 euros monthly average wage of average worker, your average pension is 50 euros. That is basically substitution rate. And on the other hand, contribution rate, as I said, is part of payroll tax that goes to pension system. So if I have this equation, and I will say, OK, I have contribution rate, and I have substitution rate. Now, let's see what should be the ratio of workers to pensioners for this particular situation to be balanced. Just take hypothetical situation of 
20% substitution rate and 20% contribution. Why do I use these numbers? Because usual pension system within the welfare states of Europe have substitution rates that are a little bit above 50%. 50, 60, if you account for, for the taxes you pay through pension system for their health care, it increases to 60%. And this cost of 20% um, contribution rate is basically a little bit above than the average of contribution rates in Europe. It's around 10 to 15%, sometimes 16, 17. So this is defensive strategy for us. We are taking the assumptions that are pretty much in favor of defenders of public pension system. And even with those assumptions, we can show following. You take this here, and you have The basic reason why I'm writing this is because you get a pretty simple uh, solution when you put this into the meaning of those two funds. So this here, as I explained previously, is just the other way of saying substitution rate. Why? Average pension related to the average wage. So this is substitution rate. And this is contribution rate. So your required ratio of workers to pensioners should be, should be substitution rate over contribution rate. In our situation, it's 0.5 over 0.2, you get 2.5. Not very complicated. So basically, if you want to have balanced system, your ratio of workers to engineers should be substitution rate divided by contribution rate. And in this situation, defensive assumption situation is 2.5. The only problem about this, not a single European country would fulfill these requirements. Not a single European country has actually 2.5 workers per one pensioner. I read one research that it said that in 2025, in Germany, there will be more people older than 65 than people younger than 65. With average employment rates in Germany, that means that this number is not going to be 2.5. It's going to be 0.6, 0.7. So you will have two times more pensioners than workers. And the idea is to have small contribution to find a substantial substitution. If you have too many, if you have two times more workers, how can you finance that currently financed system? No way. So the biggest problem with public pension system is this ratio. This ratio is the source of unsustainability of public pension systems. Number of workers today is simply not enough to finance currently financed pay-as-you-go system. Why is that so? Well, the thing is that when those system was introduced for the first time in 1889, Bismarck promised pension for everybody who is older than 70. The only problem, average uh, age expectancy then was about 40 years. So basically he promised to pay something that most probably he won't have to pay. And later, after the Second World War, there was a baby boom. <coughs> and also many people started working. Women started joining the workforce. And many people who came from the war started working. And the numbers were huge. You had in Serbia, you had eight workers per one pensioner. But medicine improved. Life conditions improved. People started living longer. And then, then the number of pensioners started growing. People didn't die that early. And the retirement age was decreased to 50. I mean, this is crazy, but I'm absolutely sure that if someone would go out today and say, I have a cure for cancer, he will get, for sure, Nobel Prize for Medicine. But he will also get maybe 20 to 30 fi ministry finances around the world committing suicide. <laughs> I'm absolutely sure, because you cannot finance the system if people don't die. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the morbidity of this system. That's, that's crazy. It's a win-win. It's a win-win situation. No, it's not. A, it's a lose-lose situation. 
Public pension system, it's a lose-lose situation. Why? Because the only way it can be sustainable, it's either population growing and you have a growing number of workers, or either population dying and you have a decreasing number of pensioners. That's the only way this system can actually financially function. And that really happened until 70s. But uh, in, at the end of 70s, when uh, there was a huge unemployment all around the world, and then in the 80s, when baby boomers didn't deliver the same amount of children who will substitute them in the workforce, and then in the 90s, when people started living above 70 in the majority of countries, these ratios dropped below 3 and then below 2, and today they are between 1 and 2. One and one and a half in majority of countries. That is why this system is absolutely unsustainable. And if the same demographic trends continue, and they will continue, this system is a time bomb. And it will blow up. And it will blow up financially, and it will destroy the social fabric of our societies. And I will speak about that a little bit later. Let us see now the most in interesting thing of this lecture, and that's example of Serbia. These are the numbers. In the paper that I wrote, you have more numbers. You can download the PDF of the lecture. But basically, these are the, the, the most important numbers that I want you to see now. And I want to put, point to you three most important numbers here. First one, look at the number that represents average pension in Serbia. It's 200 euros. 60% of pensioners today receive less than 200 euros in Serbia. Who can live with 200 euros a month? That's the cruel reality of our pension system. That's how much pension system in Serbia delivers. It's the reality, it's a fact. The other two important numbers is look at the number of, of workers that pay taxes, and number of pensioners. In early spring, spring 2012, for the first time, number of workers in Serbia was less than the number of people who receive pensions. Basically, this is not the number of workers. Total employment in Serbia is around uh, 2.1 million. But the point is that legal employment is 1.725 million people. And from those 7.25 million people, 50,000 do not pay contributions because they work for government firms that are in restructuring or that are in uh, financial blockade. So basically, you have only 1.675 wor uh, million workers that pay every month contributions. And you have 1.69 million pensioners. So there is a smaller number of people who contribute and who have 440 euros on average to pay 200 euros average pension. How can that be sustainable? Let's grind those numbers in these equations. I won't do the equations right now, but if you want, in the paper, everything is done. So you can read it. First and most important thing, Monthly contributions cover only 46% of monthly needs for pensions. So less than a half of the system is financed through contributions. That's how big deficit is. If you have 12% of GDP or 11% of GDP going to pensions and half of it is deficit, deficit of pension system is 5, 6% of GDP. It's 2 billion euros every year. So that's the real sustainability of system. Less than 50% is financed through the system. Ratioed workers, and we've seen this example. For this example, it's 2.5. Ratio in Serbia is 0.97. It's less than 1. And it's the first time in history of Serbia that the ratio is less than 1. And I don't know the country, except maybe for Japan, that has less than 1 ratio. So this is of one of the worst case scenarios in world today and really important lesson for everybody outside of Serbia because they will know where they will come in next 15 to 20 years. 
these ratios will drop to these ratios really, really soon. The needed ratio for public pension system in Serbia to be sustainable is 2.1. Probably doesn't say much to you. It should be 2.1, it's 0.97. But let's put it in the millions of people, <laughs> millions of men. You would need 3.5 million workers of same taxable wage to work and legally pay contributions in Serbia for you to have sustainable pension system. That's assuming that average wage doesn't fall with doubling the employment, and that's absolutely impossible. But still, this equation says that you would need 3.5 million workers with same wage, and you have only 2.1. That will mean at least 2 million more workers. When there is a political campaign, and they talk about how many jobs they will create, they talk in tens of thousands. Some talk in hundreds of thousands, but it's always 50, 100, 200,000 more jobs. We need two million. That's how big hole is in public pension system of Serbia. The only problem, highest number of employment with one million greater population of Serbia 20 some years ago was 2.2 million. That's the highest legal population ever in Serbia. That's our record. That's our best. That was the best we ever did. And you need 3.5 for this system to be sustainable. This system of 200 euros average pension a month. This poor, miserable system of 200 euros a month. What is the conclusion? There is no possible way and no circumstances in which you would get enough people to finance this system. Defenders of public pension system in Serbia would tell me that if we had a huge economic growth, if we had good reforms, if we had better tax collection, if we had better employment, if we didn't have corruption, if I don't know what else, if we control benefits, then we might solve the problem. Also, the most interesting uh, argument for me is if we uh, re re retrieve the previous savings and previous investment of pension funds, if, they give, if we give them back buildings they built during the 70s, then the system will be uh, balanced. Those things are gone, they're spent. And the system is spending double its contributions. We will see later the uh, numbers that show the best case scenario of Serbia and what could happen within that scenario. Basic problem of Serbia is that workers contribute 22% to the pension fund and they pay taxes. And from those taxes, 24% of average wage is added to pension system to finance pensions. What that means illustrated for a common man. That means that government comes and goes to your parents' pockets and it takes 22% of their wage, 22% of things they earn a month and gives there to your grandparents. And then it goes to pocket of everyone else, also your parents, and take 24% of their average wage more and give to your grandparents. And then your parents had to take some money from their pocket additional and give to your grandparents because average pension is only 200 euros and nobody can live with it. <laughs> That's the crude reality of public pension system in Serbia. It basically means that implicit costs, the real costs of public pension system in Serbia is 46% of average wage. 46% of everything legally employed earn goes just to finance pension system. 22% goes through contributions, 24% goes through taxes. So this contribution rate in Serbia, 22% of payroll tax for pensions, is meaningless if even more than that has to be financed through taxes. 
That is how huge are the costs of public pension system. So the benefits is 200 euros average a month. Costs is 46% of average wage a month. Those are the real costs and real benefits of public pension system in Serbia. And still, deficit is huge. 2 billion euros every year. If you want to have balanced budget with 22% contributions, your average pension in Serbia should be 96 euros. That's how much really current system can finance. 96 euros. Just imagine how would it be to live with 96 euros a month. That's the strength of our public pension system. So let's look at the best case scenario. Let's pretend we'll have 5% growth next year and next 10 years. Let's pretend we will have 700 additional jobs and we recover the record of ever greatest employment and add a bit more. So the best case scenario of employment, best case scenario of growth, and we do not really raise benefits. They just follow the inflation. Within this situation, in the next five to 10 years, we will still have 30% of deficit within the system. So there is no particular way in which you can reform a current system and have it balance, not even in the short run. Now, we finish the example of Serbia, and we will see what parametric reform means. Parametric reform is actually trying to change some of the parameters of this equation, trying to balance the system. So basically, there are three things you can do within uh, parametric reform. And yes, I have to mention, every single country during this crisis tried a parametric reform. And from their efforts, we can see how difficult it is, how unsustainable it is, and how the results are actually not important for our story. They're so small, they're so insignificant, they do not even closely solve the problem of imbalances of expenses and costs within the public pension system. The three things you can do. You can postpone the retirement. You can prolong retirement age. That's what something countries did. That's what Germany did. They tried to postpone the retirement of working people. The only problem with postponing retirement, you do not solve the current problem. People don't just stop being pensioners because you stop someone else from becoming a pensioner. Real costs today are the same. So you didn't solve the problem. You just postponed the problem for the future and you maybe decreased the future costs in two, three, five years. But you didn't solve problem today and deficits today are huge. Second thing you can do, you can increase taxes. But the only problem is that if you increase taxes and you decrease a deficit, your implicit cost stays the same. This is basic idea. In Serbia, for example, you have 46% of costs. This is now, this is future with raised taxes. So 22% is system, pension system, 24% is from taxes. You increase uh, taxes from 22 to 30, you just did this. You didn't solve the problem, because still you have deficit that has to be covered through public revenues. So you maybe decrease other public revenues, but you increase public revenues from pensions. So basically you do not solve the solvency problem of public pension system. You just um, do a counter scheme where you transfer the costs on the paper from one fund to the other, but it also goes through a general government. So the only real solution left to balance the system is to significantly cut the benefits. You cut the pensions. And we've seen in Serbia, if you want to balance the system, you have to go to 96 euros. If you want to increase the level of sustainability of public pension system, that means you have to go down with pensions, not freeze them. Majority of countries tried it. 
maybe only one or two su succeeded to decrease pensions. But basically what majority of countries did is just froze the pensions at one level. That actually means that you're, again, just limiting the current expenses. You're not decreasing the deficit. And that's the greatest problem of pension system. Parametric reform doesn't solve the problem if you do not change substantially parameters in the way unforeseeable in the history of democratic societies. <clears throat> the first problem of these parametric reforms is social and political issues. Socially, significant cut in cuts in benefits would mean that many people will suffer, will have a significant drop of their income. It will be a huge social problem, especially because majority of people who receive pensions today didn't foresee a cut in half of their pensions. And that's the only two, uh, thing you can do to balance the system. Uh, secondly, if you ask politicians not to increase benefits, it's like going to Apple and say to them, do not produce smartphones. You're basically asking politicians not to take charge upon the most increasing segment of their market. They have this huge number of voters that is ever growing. It's the biggest political market today, biggest increase of, of one uh, particular part of the market. They can draw a really, really huge number of votes from there, and you're actually asking politicians to drop the chance to win them. It's like getting a child to candy store and say you cannot buy anything. It's politically impossible. Especially, remember the situation in Germany in 20 years, or 10 years. You have more people over the 65, you have more people in retirement than people working. Do you think it will be easier to raise benefits or cut spending and taxes? Politically, I think the answer is pretty obvious. And the second thing about parametric reform is dynamic imbalances, dynamic unsustainability. What is the problem? Well, you balance the system today, but demographic change goes, and there is tomorrow's deficit that will be created from the dropping ratios. So basically, even if we had this, this beautifully easy parametric reform that would balance system today, that will not solve problem tomorrow. For a really sustainable system, you have to have surpluses that goes to savings, that goes to investment, that increase benefits to cover increasing number of retirees. So the only way we can sus have sustainable system is to run surpluses. And not a single country today has surplus of public pension system. So in the long run, even if you balance, you're unsustainable. And there are two most important problems of parametric reforms. What parametric reforms do, they just decrease current costs, current deficits for, let's say, 100 billion to 95 billion or 90 billion. That's the amount of money you can save through parametric reform. It's not a long-run solution for public pension system. Let's run through some the, the two most important points of economic problems of public pension system. There is no savings. Nothing backs <coughs> pensions in the future. There is no real tangible asset that can be a collateral for the promise and obligation that government made towards you who are working. It's only a promise. There is nothing that really backs those funds. It's a Ponzi scheme. It works only if you have increasing number of workers that will tomorrow contribute to your pension. So it's a promise today of government that in 40 years there will be someone who will pay for your pension. And if that someone, the number of those someones doesn't increase, it's a Ponzi scheme. It works only when you have increasing ratios. And they are decreasing for 40 years. <coughs> Pay-as-you-go system is only transfer of spending, but there is also one important issue. When you take income from people who are working and give income to pensioners, you're basically transferring money from people who might save to people who do not save at all. 
So you decrease the number of savings in society. Not just that the public pension system doesn't save, and it should, but people do not save. That's exactly what happens in the Western world. Today's savings rate, except from Germany and some other countries of the same culture, you do not have high saving rates. People do not save. People just spend. And what's the problem with that? Well, if people are not saving, there is no savings as an aggregate, there is no investment, there is no accumulation of capital, you do not increase future frontiers of your production possibilities of the economy. Actually, you're not investing, investing in tomorrow's production. If you're not investing in tomorrow's production, there will be no rise in wages that will pay rising expenses of the public pension system. So basically, without savings, there is no economic growth. And that's basically what we see today. <clears throat> OK, the problem with public pension system, it's also fiscal. Increasing amounts of money that go to public pension system means that public spending is skyrocketing. In nominal numbers, it's huge rise in public spending. And also, since public spending today is, is in balance, and the biggest deficit that drives the rise in public spending is, pub, is public pension system, pension system actually drives the rise in indebtedness of every single Western nation today. And the public debt is rising pretty, pretty fast. Now we come to the third part of our lecture today, and that's talk about morality of pay as you go system. I will not make here a libertarian point because I do not believe that this topic is, um, I do not believe that this topic can be uh, looked from different morals perspectives. It has to be addressed from everybody. Everybody has to focus on this question. You have to have wide support for any reform to happen within the pension system. And therefore, arguments should not be libertarian, socialist, social democrat, or any. It should be economic, because we are talking about economic problem of unsustainability of one system. Financial imbalance. And there are some important issues that are economic that can help you tomorrow develop arguments within your debates, within your working, maybe within uh, creating some policy proposal tomorrow. First problem, there is no property. The pension of tomorrow is only a promise. Your contributions today, once they leave your pocket, you do not own them. And since there is no property, there is no property rights. And having no property rights have, can have some serious circumstances. From those, I will mention two, which are really important. Imagine your parents, one of your parents goes to pension. OK, no, it's morbid. Imagine one guy, he just went to pension, he retired, he got his approval, he got his, um, all the papers through bureaucracy, he got it, he's walking down the street, he wants to enter pension administration and to receive his, per, his first benefits. And he's walking down the road, he crosses the street, car hits him, he dies. He loses everything doesn't own anything. There is no tangible asset that he really owns. What happens with his family? He contributed. In Serbia, 46% of net wage. So you contribute half of your wage just to finance the system. And what you basically get for that is nothing. The best case scenario is that a child, if it's not legally employed, can receive 70% of the pension for one year that his parents should have had. What's the real situation? You lose almost anything just because you died. I mean, it's a horrible situation, and probably someone who dies doesn't think, oh, I will not receive pension. <laughs> but still, it's an economic issue. Because there is no property rights, this cannot be solved. And it's also unfair. You contribute for 40 years, and you get nothing and someone else can contribute for 20, 30 years and get benefits for 20, 30 years just because he was lucky for, to cross the other street the same day. And the second thing, if you're seriously ill, not you, someone, 
If someone is really seriously ill and he needs money for medical treatment, heart transplant, if you have saved some tangible asset, you could recollect it, sell it, or recollect money and use it to finance your heart transplant. Without heart transplant, you will die or that person will die. And if he dies, he doesn't receive any benefits. But he contributed. In public pension system, even though you have contributed, you didn't receive any ownership, so you cannot spend it. And you will, you will not be able, in these circumstances, retrieve something that you really uh, contributed and your loss is certain. And therefore, these are some situations in which lack on, of ownership on things can, re can have really sus uh, substantial circumstances, real substantial <coughs> implications. Now, also, one economic issue here is lack of flexibility. You are actually obligated to contribute to public pension system. Even though if you say, I do not want for government to provide me with pension when I get older, you cannot say, I want to opt out. You have to stay in the system and contribute. Also, government fits everybody with the same pair of shoes. Same contribution rates. You cannot even contribute more if you want to and get more benefits tomorrow. You have the level of contribution that is regulated and you cannot contribute more. You cannot save more. You cannot save more and then go to pension earlier. You cannot uh, control the, the way you will receive benefits. You cannot collect them in half at start and then small, small installments later or collect all at once or collect installments for a secure period of years. You basically control nothing. You have a linear system that is same for everybody, but we are not all the same. We would like a different system within the private, private savings system, not pensions, just when you go to, to bank. Everybody tries to get different deal for them because you want different stuff. Someone wants to save, someone wants to spend, someone wants to save more, someone wants to retire early, someone like me wants to re retire never. But you have to within the public pension system. And that's the big problem of flexibility of public pension system. Also, there is no real link between contributions and benefits. If you want to hear more about this, read Jose Piñera. The main point is, basically, the benefits you get are not linked directly with your contributions. They're subject to political manipulation, they're subject to changes in economic circumstances, you can contribute for 40 years and then recession comes and your benefits are cut even though you contributed fairly your percentage of contributions. So if there is no link between benefits and behavior, then behavior is not incentivized. That's why there is no savings within the public pension system. And let us now go to fourth and final point of my today's lecture, and that is pension reform. We've seen that parametric reform doesn't solve the big problem that dynamic unsustainability that exists in public pension system creates as a um, deficit that are huge today. So parametric reform doesn't, doesn't change it, doesn't solve it. The only real alternative to public pension systems, basically there are two alternatives, and uh, this is one of them, private, private savings accounts. The other alternative is no system. And I think that I could defend a position that no system, just abolishment of public pension system would be better than having public pension system. These miserable 200 euros a month, I believe every single person could save enough in the future. Without designed pension system, without the real reform, even with no pension system, it would be better than the public pension system. And in foreseeable future, since demographics will not change dramatically in Serbia, we will hit the wall. And when we hit the wall, if there is no political strength to start the reform, the result will be no system. And that will be better than this system. Less expensive with more benefits. Basic principles are here of private saving system. If you want to read more about it, there are, some, there are a few blog posts in my blog. In Serbian, there are many papers in English. 
Of course, I recommend reading Jose Pinera, who is the idea creator and the main reformer in Chile who applied this system. Hello, Chile. <laughs> and uh, I strongly recommend looking at his videos, at YouTube, or reading his texts. Basically, everything is explained. So I won't go to private pension system. Others did it much better than me. But what I want to point out is what are the problems of privatization? Because we've seen, OK, I mean, the whole lecture can be summarized in five seconds. Public pensions are bad, savings accounts are alternative, reform is hard, and we should do it. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so that, that's the basic point. So OK, private pension system is better. The greatest problem is how you go there. And that means privatization, that means reform, and that means a huge cost. And what are these costs driven with? First, you have to finance current pensioners. You have to continue financing people who are currently retired. And if you take people to private pension system, you draw out their contributions. The gap widens. It gets bigger. In most harsh years of reform, transition costs that are meant by this, go up to 4 to 5% of GDP. And you have to find a way to finance it. This would mean a great drawbacks in public finances, in other expenditures. Second problem, how do you compensate people who contributed previously? Because someone worked for 20 years, he paid contribution, he wants to go to private system, but for next 20 years, he cannot collect enough to go to decent pension. And still, he contributed something, and if you want to introduce property rights and pension, you have to compensate for it. So that's the second really important question. And the third one is, how do you organize a new institutional framework within which you have efficiently functional capital markets and new pension institutions? These are three most important questions that have to be answered within the any framework of pension reform in Serbia and every other country today. These costs are huge. Total cost of pension privatization probably goes to 150 or 200% GDP of every single country. In Serbia, I calculated previously, we would need 55 to 60 billion euros for the whole transition for 10 years to spend on pension reform. It would be a biggest reform project ever in Serbia. So that's how big this problem is. But sustainability of public pension system, not public pension system, but any pension system, is measured by the level of its private share. So if 80% of system is private, it's 80% sustainable. The other part is just expenses, it's public expenses. So what you need today is reform that will substantially increase the share of private system within a pension system for it to be at least a bit more sustainable or financially sustainable on its own. The longer we wait, the harder it gets because ratios drop and contributions drop and benefits rise. Remember the political issue. So basically, the earlier we start the reform, the earlier it will get better. And we will have to do it. So it's not the issue of political party, of the ideology. It's tangible economic cost that has to be resolved somehow. There is no free lunch. There is no free pension. So reform is also almost impossible during a recession. And we are currently in a recession. So we might wait three to five years to start the reform. But this is the perfect moment to start preparing for the reform. And any good reform framework, I think, should have next five points in its strategy. First one is parametric pre-reform. So you start from today, you prolong working age, at least to level the life expectancy. You also uh, decrease benefits or freeze them, control their rise, control their, their level. And of course, 
increase tax collection, have some changes within the taxes, make it more easier to pay, and then more people pay, and those kind of things. Have more, more substantial tax collection within the gray economy. Those hard things have to be done. Second thing, I think that this reform cannot be financed only solely through current taxes. And I suggest, this is a special case for Serbia, of course, that we impose 10% flat rate tax on income for everybody to contribute for this social reform. So we are saving the future of a country. Everybody has to participate in either way, because if we don't, the system will collapse. Social fabric of our society will disperse. And we will have not just unsustainable pension system, we will have unsustainable democracy, unsustainable public finance, unsustainable defense, unsustainable society. Then also we should have a system of government bonds. A system of government bonds that, con uh, that uh, is used to compensate previous contributors so you give them government bonds, they're invested in um, private systems. Difference between this and giving contributions to public pension system is that you get the ownership. You get the collection of taxes in the future without public pension system. And from those collections, your private property will be financed. And you're actually giving back some, some money as if it was contribution, but you get the property. And also government bonds could be issued to spur a capital market. It, it was uh, basically the biggest part of um, development of capital markets in Eastern Europe, who did not have capital markets because you didn't have any private capital during socialism. So basically the way the private markets were developed is the introduction of government bonds. And that, is also, that also should be included in the strategy. And then the most important point, the level of privatization you think you should have within the system. And I don't mean you should have in the level of what's your ideology that the level should be. But what is the, what is the politically sustainable level of privatization you can finance and politically support with wide-scale support for one system? And I think that this thing can politically be sold to every single political ideology. Socialists should support it because it creates a huge number of worker capitalists, as Jose Piñera would say. That actually means that people start owning the means of production. You're owning the pension funds which own production resources. But if it's the only way to reform the system, maybe it should be considered. And also, you need a complementary free market reform of wide scale to spur economic growth for the whole reform and privatization to be easier, more sustainable, and cheaper. There is no easy solution. And there is no straightforward answer. And of course, the experience of other countries can be used as um, good knowledge for your design of your reform, but basically is not a perfect solution. There is none. And reform is highly expensive, expensive. And if you reform, there is no guarantee that it will succeed. But still, the only way we can go is that way. So my idea about level of prioritization is to go from something like this within the three pillar system. Three pillar system means that first pillar is mandatory Public system, second pillar is private system, and the third one is additional private voluntary system. And basically what you want within this uh, pension reform is to move from almost totally public system, which is financially, as we pointed 14 plus times before, unsustainable, and go towards something more private. Go to the system where safety net is, let's say, 25% of the system, financing only the people who cannot save enough and not giving them real money, but giving their subsidies or giving them some bonds to increase their savings accounts. But still, you want people to have savings accounts. Every single person has to have saving account because that is the way you can decrease the number of people who are just on the welfare programs. And also, you want to increase voluntary additional system because that means that people voluntarily save 
more than they should, that you have responsible persons and responsible uh, society, which saves for the future. So let me come to the conclusion. We've seen that public pension system is a Ponzi scheme. It works only if number of workers <coughs> increases and the number of pensioners decreases. This ratio has to be high for the system to be sustainable. And it isn't because of demographic change. And that change will not go back, it will just continue the same way. As Professor Brahma, uh, you uh, yesterday said one interesting thing. The public pension system is like a car that goes towards us. And it will hit us. And it will hit us soon, when this system totally breaks apart. Serbian pension system is in deficit and in bankruptcy for 30 years. It's a track. It's a track, yeah. It's economically expensive, corrupt, and morally questionable pension system and should be questioned in the public policy and social discussion debate today, not in the future. We have to address this question now and to put it in the focus of social debate today. We've seen that private ref the reform to private system is really, really expensive and challenging. And I've shown you the three important questions that have to be answered and five-point framework in which you might de deliver some policy proposal or um, design of strategy of political change that will lead us to more private system. And there is no easy solution. But I don't want you to go from this session in the next three or four hours with the idea that it's too hard, it's impossible politically, and we shouldn't do it. Or collapse will come soon, leave it to collapse. I think that there is no doubt that the only way modern societies should go is toward more private and less public pension system. Thank you.